Hi, um, I'm Gordon. I'm from New Atlantis. I'm here with our chief scientist, Jay, who's back in the corner over there. Um, we're an we're a ocean regeneration project that's focused on the intersection of uh, regenerative finance and uh, DSI. Um, and so we're going to be talking a little bit about both us as a, a practical example of this and also what re refi is or regenerative finance. So in a nutshell, what we're really trying to do with New Atlantis is sort of uh, biodiversity loss and climate change are major issues, which we're all sort of increasingly aware of. Uh, within the oceans, like the oceans kind of happen out there and are often the, un, or, you know, the, the forgotten aspect of climate change and nature loss. And, but they're also the largest biome on the planet. They comprise 70% of the surface of the oceans. And sort of the living oceans themselves are about 1.3 billion cubic kilometers. So it's a, a big and important aspect of global ecosystems. And part, part of the problem that we have today in the oceans is that we are effectively killing them off through overfishing and through pollution and through climate change. And so what we're doing with New Atlantis is we're really focusing on how can we align value creation for humans with increasing health in the oceans. And this is really the regenerative finance piece of what we do. So refi plus desi is uh, what we call resi, although I think there are some people out here who are also popularizing the term resi as well. So in brief, refi is really looking at economics and trying to recenter economics around positive externalities. So as I think many people are aware, uh, our global economic system sort of suffers from many issues from wealth inequality to environmental degradation and uh, sort of zero sum thinking about things. Regenerative finance is really looking at how can we uh, create more circular economies that function within planetary boundaries and do that so that you can align ecological health with the well-being or with financial well-being. DSI, as we all know, is open science. And so given the scale and scope of a lot of environmental problems and given that many of these environmental problems are going to be heavy data, heavy, heavily data-driven uh, issues and solutions are going to require big data solutions, it's kind of natural to want to match refi with DSI so that you can build an economic framework that's powered by the actual underlying data to produce outputs that are pro, pro, pro both pro-social and pro-planet. So how does the actual market mechanism work in our case? So at a high level, what we're trying to seek to do is essentially aggregate the collective intelligence of the ocean community. So as you can see, there's like a lot of people in the ocean community who are producing amazing science and tools and research, but they're very isolated. They're kind of stuck in their academic labs in a lot of cases, and they don't have a lot of commercial opportunity to monetize or expand their work. But what we're building with, on top of Bacalhau as well, um, which is our compute platform, um, which is very exciting, we're building an open uh, biodiversity analytics platform so that we are, we are putting in place an infrastructure that allows for a metagenomic, metagenomic uh, baseline data set of the oceans. And what that does, or what that means, is that we're taking water samples from marine protected areas. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I'm still a little jet lagged. It's not my best presentation today. Um, we're taking marine, uh, water samples from marine protected areas. We do DNA analysis on them so that we can see what species are living there in what relative abundance and also understand the ecological health of those species. And so that allows us to sort of essentially do preventative medicine for the oceans. And on top of that, we're enabling scientists who are building ecological trait models, as well as also developing data sets to contribute their work to create a meta model that will allow us to quantify biodiversity more effectively. And so what this enables the scientists to do is to contribute their, uh, their whether it's a model or a data set, to the meta model, and then as those meta models are, or as, as their models are used in the minting of the biodiversity credits, they can get paid. So if, if your model contributes 1% of the value to the credit, you get a percentage of every credit that we mint. So it's a way for scientists to actually make money on the, on the work that they're doing, which is fantastic, I think. So, 
So you start with one of the things that's kind of interesting about what we do, which makes it complex but also fascinating, is we have to work with governments and NGOs. And so the macro goal here is to essentially get, and this is set by the UN, not by us, <laughs> excuse me, is we need to get 30% of the oceans into what are called marine protected areas by 2030. And a marine protected area is essentially like a, it's like a national park for the oceans. Right now, the world has technically 8.1% of the world's oceans are in marine protected areas, but really only 2.4% of them are actually fully protected. So we have a long way to go to get to the 30% of fully protected marine protected areas. And the way that and the problem with marine protected areas is that they're government programs and they're not well funded. And so they're typically underfunded and called paper parks. And the vast majority of them exist in the global south where given deglobalization, energy shortages, and inflation, it's unlikely that these projects are gonna get the adequate funding that they need. And so by allowing us to go into the marine protected areas, sequence the life in those areas, we can quantify the life that's there, we can make estimates on how much biodiversity is in there, as well as also how much blue carbon is there. And that will allow the, oops, excuse me, that will allow the marine protected areas to start to generate credit values from, or to generate credits that they can sell on the open markets to fund their resources and to fund their conservation efforts internally. So what we're essentially doing is giving a business model to, to MPAs. And we do that by, with this open uh, cycle here. Sorry, this is a little confusing, I understand, but. Um, and coming back to the point about biodiversity, so we are seeking to quantify biodiversity. This is a very big, complex problem. Our goal is to really create a container for open, or to collect open intelligence from the ocean data set and allow people who understand and are developing functional trait models about how do you measure biodiversity to contribute and create an aggregate model. And so this is, you know, these are some certain examples of, of how you might do that today. And if we can create a meta model that will allow us to create that fungible unit of biodiversity, that will allow the marine protected areas to develop credit models that they can then sell on the open market. So this is a sort of quick summary view of like the New Atlantis framework. So the ecological models get contributed by the science community. The data sets get contributed from the marine protected areas around the world. As those come in, they get aggregated into the meta model. The meta model then outputs those quantified biodiversity units, which then produce revenue streams from ESG reporting for biodiversity metrics, blue carbon, which I don't know how much people work on the carbon markets here, but blue carbon is a major area of opportunity. Uh, the oceans sequester 16 times as much carbon as all terrestrial ecosystems <laughs> combined. So it's gonna be very important that we figure out how to onboard the oceans for climate change issues. Marine biodiversity, this is our main focus. Like we think marine biodiversity markets are gonna be much, much larger, <laughs> excuse me, much, much larger than credit markets, um, or than carbon credit markets. And the main reason we think that biodiversity markets are gonna be massive is because life itself has real value, whereas carbon is kind of a waste product at the end of the day. People don't really use excess CO2, people use life. They benefit from ecotourism, they benefit because they eat it, three billion people de uh, depend on the oceans for primary protein. Um, and then there is also bioprospecting, which we think is gonna be a major area of opportunity as well. Bioprospecting is, <laughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Bioprospecting is essentially um, looking in the genome of the ocean to try to see what kind of life might be, what kind of uh, pharma products or synthetic biology products might be resident in there. So a good example of something that we're looking at right now is plastic degrading enzymes in plankton. And so can you imagine if we could solve the, the plastic problem in the ocean by figuring out what plankton that already exists in nature that is inclined to eat plankton, amplify those genes in nature, eat the plankton in the ocean, or you rather eat the plastic in the ocean, which creates the food, more biomass for the fish, which increases fish biomass overall, which is a net positive for everybody as well. Um, revenue participation. 
So it's very important, and Kelsey, I would love to talk to you more wherever you went. Um, there you are. Because we think that governance is going to be a big piece of governance and revenue are very aligned in what we're doing. Like how the money flows is going to be super important. So for us, the big revenue participants are the MPAs themselves and the, the host governments. Like we have to, for good or for evil, we have to work with the governments around the world because these MPAs are national organizations. Um, local communities are absolutely essential to get them on board because if you don't get the local communities on board, none of this, <laughs> none of this works. And this is where governance actually is a big deal as well. Uh, contributing scientific labs, obviously that's a, a, a key piece of it because if you're gonna work in scientific, if you're gonna work in ecological data, you really wanna make sure that you're actually sort of underpinned by good science and, and, and strong data and reproducible results for the DSI labs component. Um, NGOs, again, um, a lot of NGOs do great work. Sometimes they're a necessary evil, um, but they are a player at the table. Investors, we also think it's going to be super, super important for people to be able to make money by improving the health of the oceans. The ocean, uh, the blue economy is estimated, depending on whose estimates you look at, at anywhere between like 16 to 29 trillion dollars a year. So it's a lot of money that is potentially out there to be made and to be monetized, but hasn't yet, um, market mechanisms have this, we have this thing that has incredible value, but no price to it yet. But we're starting to see that as we bump up against the ecological boundaries, if we don't start to price the thing that we are currently assigning a zero price to, but that has huge value. We're going to squeeze it until it will no longer work. Because you can squeeze an ecosystem and get improved performance out of it in terms of economic output only for so long before you kill it. And if you kill it, that's a problem. So given that the oceans produce 50% of the world's project or oxygen, they're the world's primary uh, biomass producer, um, and a lot of people depend on them as well as the global ecosystems. Um, and ultimately, also, uh, New Atlantis makes money on this as well. So <laughs> we are a for-profit. We're very focused on uh, aligning uh, profit incentives with ecological outcomes. We think that it should... Um, we think that being, people should be able to make money by making the world a better place. Like, the uh, nonprofits and NGOs are fantastic, um, but they're unreliable, and so this is where regenerative finance becomes really, really important. If you can start to build economic systems that will allow people to like, align their well-being, their personal well-being, with the macro good, then you have a real win on your hands. So uh, the platform status of what we're doing, so we just completed Gitcoin round 15. Um, it was our first Gitcoin. Um, we came in number one in the DSI category, uh, number two in the climate category, and number three across all of Gitcoin out of around 1,500 projects. So um, thank you. Um, anyway, that yeah, it was great. This is an output from Jay right there who's our chief scientist over there. Um, this is a good example of what the metagenome analysis looks like. So this is a snapshot of some water samples where we can look in the water sample and classify the planktonic ecosystem based on who's there and their, and their relative abundance. Excuse me. And this becomes the baseline for, or the base asset on top of which you can run further ecological models and or contribute models yourself. Um, a big piece of what we're doing is building re our reproducible bioinformatics pipelines. And so this is very much aligned with the DSI Labs work on the, on the nodes, because reproducibility is a super important component of uh, bioinformatics. They're sort of famously unstable um, pipelines uh, because they've been very sequestered within labs. But if we're going to build a credit system on top of this, we have to have like full transparency in the marketplace so that people can like reproduce, look at the data, look at the parameter settings and reproduce the results so they can have confidence that the credit values actually represent what they think, what they're claiming to represent. Um, 
And yes, I talked perhaps not as clearly as I should have about the de developing the open collective intelligence approach, but we are very interested in working with anybody who is interested in applied big data, uh, applied ocean science, uh, governance and tokenomics, um, or just has a general interest in the oceans uh, overall. So, um, you know, new, uh, one other thing I should also mention is we are, I believe we're well positioned to scale New Atlantis very broadly. So our initial focus is really within the science community today, but two of our founding partners are well-known photographers. This is a picture from one of them, a guy named Paul Nicklin, who is the, he's the most followed photographer on Instagram. So if any of you have an Apple TV um, and the pig swimming polar bear and all the animals that you see on there, those are all his photos. And his wife is also a UN sustainability ambassador for the oceans. So as we ramp up the science piece, as we get the economics components in place, we will then be starting to do a big public outreach to really engage the uh, uh, community of concerned citizens around the world. Um, anyway, I'd love to take questions if anybody has any questions. Um, so.